And welcome back, folks. Another edition of the Michigan Insider Breakdown focused on the offense with former Michigan offensive coordinator. And he of many offensive coordinating stops, Coach Al Borges, gorgeous as those close to him like to call him. I don't know if he's really gorgeous, but, you know, we. It's a term gorgeous, of endearment. Yeah. Yeah, term, Come on. Term, term of endearment as. Uh, this has been a blast of a season to to break down with the entire crew, uh, but it really all started with Al, uh, and this season was more rewarding than than all the rest combined because we got we took a, an even deeper dive, and I think most of you enjoy taking that deep dive with us. We we obviously though did not enjoy uh, the final act uh, because it was a disappointing finish, disappointing conclusion to an outstanding season, Al. And I think that's where we need start, that this was, for Michigan, a a season that surpassed almost all expectations. Uh, and certainly those of any reasonable fan, even. No one had Michigan as a playoff team uh, this year, and yet there they were against Georgia and, of course, ending in a disappointing fashion, but not a disappointing season by any stretch. Yeah, you just can't let the game taint the season. And that's easy to do because it's the last thing that happened. And people tend to always remember the last thing that happened. But that's just not a barometer for how the season went. When you consider all that was accomplished, it's a little mind-boggling because when, if we sat in these seats last year at this time, which I think we kind of did, uh, I don't think anybody would have imagined – Michigan would have played as well as they did. But you think about the things that they did, they, you know, winning all those road games, that's not easy to do. Okay, let's start with that. Number two is finding a true identity to their offense. They were a running team built around toughness. Uh, they were balanced, but maybe not as balanced as they may be later, but certainly good enough to win 12 games. Beating Ohio State, which was that – you know, that nemesis, that demon that had to be exercised, and, and it was in a very impressive fashion. There was no fluke to how they beat Ohio State. Winning the Big Ten Championship, you know, a lot of times you, you get on such a high beating Ohio State that you blow the last game, and that's the last thing people remember. But they didn't. They, they took care of Iowa in that game. But I think uh, if you look at the sum total of what was accomplished during the course of this season – I don't know how you could be any happier. I mean, in terms of what your expectations were for what you achieved on both sides of the ball, what with all the changes that they had. I mean, it was just one hell of a football season, 12 wins, 12 hard fought wins. Uh, they did not, you know, lower to the level of the team they played. They came out and had demonstrated good leadership, toughness on both sides of the ball. I think the program, uh, certainly on the surface appears to be back. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to start with that perspective because as we break down this offense, I, I mean, it'd be very easy to uh, get to so caught up in what went wrong offensively that you lose sight of what went right all season long. It was a magnificent turnaround on both sides of the ball, but this was a game, Al, where defensively, and let me – Start out with you the way that I start out with started out with Vance. I was dead wrong, dead wrong about the quarterback matchup in this game and predicting that it would go in Michigan's favor. As if you line that position up, even though they don't face one another, and talking about who who was going to offer the better performance, I thought that Michigan was going to come out on the better end of that stick and they didn't uh, they didn't in this game and by a significant margin and that uh, in this game to me was the game because I, I i just they could play that game again and i would expect michigan to play better on both sides of the ball but i just don't know how much better defensively they were going to play based on the attack plan because Georgia did a great job of, of picking at the vulnerabilities that had emerged over the course of the season. If those hadn't been corrected, 
by game 14 now, I, I don't know that you you play that game five, six times more and that, you know, they're going to be able to exploit that any less. So what that means and what I mean by highlighting that is you're going to have to put more. You're going to have to match offensively. You're going to have to put up more points in this game. And I just, you know, with, with the way that this game played out, I, I just you, you look at the Stetson Bennett performance versus the quarterback performance for, for Michigan and uh, they just weren't able to bridge that gap in this game. No, it, it, that was my miscalculation, too. I really thought, based on just watching both teams play a bunch, I thought that uh, they would struggle more uh, moving the ball on Michigan's defense. Now, there's a reason for that, too. Uh, they did a wonderful job of game plan in the game. I can't say enough about that. The first, and I told you this earlier today, usually when I get the game video, the first thing I watch is the Michigan offense. You know, let's see what happened here. First thing I watched was Georgia's offense. I was intrigued by what happened during the game. And this was purely from a football perspective. Forget all any biases. And I wanted to see how they attacked Michigan. And it was, he did a, a great job, a great job. Uh, and they and they executed. Uh, Stetson Bennett, we never said was a bad quarterback. I just didn't think Stetson Bennett could play that well in that game. He was spot on. You know, I, I had him with 13 RPOs in the first half. I think they finished with like 16 RPOs, but they didn't need them. The second half, it was more of a ball control game. But he was just spot on with so much of what he was doing. I mean, if 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 Michigan would blitz the nickel, he'd shoot out an RPO. You know, if they'd stay in a six-man box or whatever, he, they'd run the ball. I mean, he was really, really efficient. And then, they again, they had a couple matchup considerations. They got a halfback on a linebacker and threw a deep ball to him and, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff there. So, Al, what they did with motion good. formation and tempo, yeah, in this game, those are those are picking at the vulnerabilities that I was talking no about. No question. They had they had a couple ways to tempo. They tempoed them with fast offense. Right after a first down, they would line up fast, and they had they sugar huddled them, or what 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 I I learned would call the fire alarm, where they would sugar huddle, they'd hold the huddle, break the receivers, and then usually come out in some kind of unbalanced line and snap the ball so quick you couldn't get adjusted, and they they picked the right times to do it, you know. So hats off to them. I mean, they were a good team. They really are good. Defensively, they were pretty much as anticipated. But the thing that I found, Sam, watching the video, it wasn't like they were stoning Michigan. Michigan, I think, had an eight-play drive to start the game, a seven-play drive followed by another eight-play drive. They weren't three and out, I think, to their fourth or fifth drive. They were moving fourth, fourth the ball. Drive. Fourth drive was three and out. Fourth drive. Well, there's opportunities there to answer – for those touchdowns, you know, they're, it, it, they're not, it's not like this, oh, man, we, we don't have a snowball's chance in Allen moving the ball. They were moving the ball some. Uh, but the problem is, is there were some instances on third down particularly where the chains didn't get moved and it cost them a punt. And where there was an opportunity to get the chains moved and it cost them a punt. And, and they were, you know, they were, they were running, feeling their oats. I mean, they were, they when they got the ball back, they couldn't wait, you know, uh, so – with the, when the blood was in the water, they took advantage of it to their credit. But there were some chances. And, and, and you know, the numbers probably wouldn't bear that out much. But if you study the video, there were some chances in there. There really were. But Yeah, uh, the, first th the first three drives, Al, uh, to your point, uh, and, and I think it might be worthwhile to sort of go over those drives in detail to sort of highlight the, the missed opportunities there because, you know, you're down 17 to nothing after three drives. I mean, they, they scored on every drive in the first half, first of all, Georgia. So I mean, it, it was incumbent upon Michigan. In this contest, your, your offense was going to have to trade. It is not an offense that is used to playing from behind and certainly not that far behind. And, and so what it meant, was when they had those opportunities, Al, they were going to have to be 100% or close to them, close yeah. to it. And they yeah. were not near 100% on those opportunities. For, and you can spread it across the board. I mean, were there some protection breakdowns? Absolutely, there yes. was protection yes, breakdowns. Were. Did they blow up the run at times? At times of the first three drives, Al, I mean, they, you know, there were some opportunities in there. It wasn't a whole, it wasn't like there was a whole lot of pressure or they're blowing up the line a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Not like that got worse after the third drive, right. but the first three drives to me were defined by missed opportunities. 
Case in point, Al, and you can point out some some of the things here, but what's one of the recurring things? You just talked about recurring th- themes defensively. One of the recurring themes offensively is downfield throws against zone. Mm-hmm. Downfield throws against zone. Are those check down? Uh, over the middle, particularly. Downfield mm-hmm. throws over the middle against zone. Are those check down? Are they thrown mm-hmm. short out or outside? And that was a costly habit in this contest in those first three drives out yeah uh for example there was a i believe it was a trap pass with a curl to cornelius johnson that was checked down to it to the tight end that got tipped and cornelius johnson was wide open okay and and, and the protection was good enough to make the throw but that play had been successful for him in the past and i think he leaned on it a little bit before he should have. He should have made the throw to Cornelius. You know? Yeah, and and I don't know if this showed on TV, but you can see it from the box. Cornelius Johnson just he throws his hands. Very frustrated. He's, yeah, you could. He's like it. you could you could see the yeah. frustration for him. And then you know another play, Al. Uh, it, you know it was Schoonmacher running a curl. Mm-hmm. It was Schoonmacher running a curl, and I believe it was Eric All that he hit running in the flat. Mm-hmm. And now, when you water. watch those, Sam, you got to the first thing you got to do, and we did this, is Doc God, he's got to give Schumacher a chance. He's open. So, first thing you do is say, Why didn't he do it? Okay. If you're the quarterback coach, what, well, whatever. So, you go to the, 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 the copy that shows you that. And did he just, did his eyes ever go to the read? Well, on that play, his eyes went straight to all. And it was third down, and I think 14 or 15 to go. And the protection was good. Now, because sometimes the protection will rush the quarterback and he simply won't be given the opportunity to make the read. Where, But in that instance, there was plenty of time to see Schoenmacher. And then if he didn't like him, go ahead and check the ball down into the flat. So, uh, and the same thing happened on the, on the curl we were talking about, where we, the delay went down, the protection was good enough to see the curl. So we turned down an opportunity to gain 15 yards to throw a ball to the tight end that, got tipped. So who knows what would have happened. But my point is that ball should have never been thrown in the first place because the people down the field are open. Uh, But that has been a reoccurring theme. Another thing that's been a reoccurring theme are tip passes. Now tip passes are a funny thing. Okay. You can't, they're hard to control sometimes, but sometimes they can be controlled. It just depends. If a quarterback got a ball tipped and he used good footwork, he made the right read, didn't do anything out of the box that wasn't coached, I would never grade him down. Because a quarterback can't worry about that. If he's using good footwork and trying to get in the cracks in the pass rush, occasionally a guy who gets a lousy rush would put his hand up to a ball. But if his footwork's bad or he doesn't, he can't get it over a hot receiver, for example, he has to be able to do that. That Those tip passes are not acceptable. Otherwise, we got to find a quarterback that can do that, okay? And both instances came up. Now, he is a low slinger. He is a low three-quarter arm throw. That's just the nature of his throw. You don't change that throw or you don't know how to coach a quarterback, okay? Because I learned a long time ago, if you start trying to change arm angles on basic mechanical throws, the kid will throw the ball all over the lot. So you got to got to go with how he throws, coach's footwork, coach's thinking. If you don't like the way he throws, get another quarterback. Because when he's 19, 20 years old, if you think you're going to change that, you're crazy. It's not going to happen. So work within uh, what you have, okay? But now he's got to understand, if I am a low slinger, what do I got to do to avoid these issues, okay? And usually it is footwork, moving your feet around, getting the ball off on time, doing things that will keep balls from getting tipped as often. But in this game, there were two balls tipped, one on the wide delay and another ball that was hot on a rail route where no one covered Hassan Haskins. No one. Yeah, that was him. a that was a second and sixteen. That uh, you know whatever. What are they doing? Aaron throwing it down the field. Aren't throwing it to the six. That is a first down and then some. Al Borges, if if he can get it over that rushing out. To be fair, because I, I don't want to. Yeah, I I make it a point to make it make sure that we aren't piling on any, especially in a game like this where you could look across the board coaches and players on that particular play on that second and 16 play Al 
I mean, there shouldn't have been a rusher in his face, right? I mean, you, you yeah, watched it all the time. Play, they, they actually, you could see the center turn the projection to the left, which is where the ball was being thrown. And But for some reason, and I, I can't figure out why, they did not slide out to pick up the widest put rusher. And he had to throw it over a, a, a free free rusher. But that's not uncommon on a hot route, right? I mean, that happens. It's happened several times this year. So you got to find a way to – to shoot that little free throw right over his head and get it to the back. But that should have been picked up based on what I saw with regard to the communication with the center and the other line. But for some reason it didn't. And again, we're not telestrating today or I'd show you what happened, but, uh, but that was unfortunate, but you got to find a way to beat that. You know what I mean? Right. I because if he, if he does talk about the quarterback, I talk about, I don't, they don't have any names to me. Okay. Not anymore. Cause I don't coach them. I look at the position and I just assess whether it was done right or wrong, in my opinion. And this is my opinion because someone else may say, no, 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 we coach him to do this. God bless you. Then that's to get it done that way. That's that's there's no one way to do anything. But I watch it. You put JJ in there. I'll critique him the same as I critique. Right. Back number. So uh, either you do it or you don't do it, either do it right or you don't do it right. You know, it's, it's, it's that simple. It has nothing to do with any of that. Right. So, and and I know I, I know just this is more commentary for the, the listener than, than it is critique of, of you. This is highlighting for for effect here mm -hmm. and making it clear what we are trying to do. We are trying to you know offer analysis of what they did offensively and talk about how could it have how could it have gone different because first three drives you down 17 to nothing and there are there were opportunities to move the chains on each of those drives that were not three and out. I mean, there's the fourth down play on the first drive was there. Al Borges, mm -hmm. right? It was there. Yeah. Empty uh, Y option play. They've been run. We detailed, we actually, yeah, they, 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 they emptied the, the, the formation and worked Eric all in their safety on an option route to the boundary. It was fourth and seven. Eric, again, we, we stilled it. We watched it. We paused it. He was a yard past the first down and the ball was thrown poorly. It was a, uh, he touched the ball, but it was going to, had he had to catch it and dive, he wouldn't have got the first down. But right. again, again, it's a pitch and catch that can move the change. You got to make the throw. That's so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a coach here. I'm, I'm basing my analysis in part on what you coaches are saying. I think that when you critique defensively, the, the critique is, is, is more about the chess match. And they, Munkin did a hell of a job. In scheme in Michigan up. I think the critique offensively is in personnel decisions. Because to me, for them to have a chance for this game to be close, uh, and, and I'm not saying if they do this that they would have won, because Georgia is a really, really good team, very well coached. They have pro talent all over the place. So I want to give them a ton of credit. But to me, for them to have a chance in this game, after drive three, when they're down 17 to nothing, you got to make a quarterback change, in my opinion, to have a chance to make this game close. Because those first three drives showed you the limitations that you were going to have. And from that point on, things just got worse. Yeah. In, in my, well, I mean, hindsight is 2020, but I was thinking that at the time. And certainly once they got to halftime, like, man, shoot. Uh, especially as the protection got worse. Yeah. Like, well, then, man, I really need yeah. to go to JJ. That, that jumped out later, and they did that. That jumped out at them. I mean, that, the protection was holding up, and, and it's not going to hold up when you're losing real bad and you have to pass. Not very many people can protect their quarterback when they're way behind. Not very many teams can do that. So, and Michigan isn't that type of team to start with, even though they have a good offensive line, but that offensive line is dependent on balance to make all those, that pass protection work good. So here's here's your – your uh, dilemma, okay? When you uh, have had a kid play 12 games or 13 games, whatever it was, and has won the championship of the league and all that, and he's done some very nice things for you, the message you'd like to send to your team, you'd like to send this team to your team, is I'm going to give him a chance to bring us back. Mm -hmm. If I start pulling him out of the game every time we're behind or every time the fans start booing, Right. I'm not sending much of a message to him and I'm not sending much of a message to the team. So that's one argument and it's a damn good argument. Okay. Cause you're asking him to lead your team and 
tough times, you know, you always talk, we got to deal with adversity. We got to do well, hell you live. We got to deal with adversity. You just put me on bench. Give me a chance. Right. That's his argument. And the argu other argument is this. I'm the coach. I got to give us the best chance to win the game. Okay. Uh, and at this point in the game, we have to get a mobile quarterback in the game. Win. You said after three, four drives, that may be true. That maybe, maybe even earlier than that. Who knows? Because right, after after three drives, it wasn't the pressure hadn't really, you know, it, it wasn't like it it got like it, it, after the third drive. Now the pressure is in his face all the time because like they're down seventeen to nothing at that point. They're pinning their ears back. But I I'm more talking about the op, the missed opportunities. Yeah, that we and, saw and three, with the two. Times. It right. pressure became more missed opportunities were early. Okay, but as you go. Uh, you got to decide that. And that's, that's not easy to do now. That's because uh, at the end of the day, you're going to have to answer to whatever decision you make right or wrong. Okay. Uh, and I've watched this over the years. I mean, I'm old and I've seen so many different deals. I do uh, Joe Montana, who a lot of people believe is the greatest quarterback in the history of the NFL. I think there's an argument against that these days for Tom Brady, but certainly Joe Montana is one of them. Well, I saw Bill Walsh take him out of a game and put in Steve Young because of that this very thing, this exact thing we're talking about. It wasn't going real good at the beginning. The rush was getting heavy. They needed to get a guy in there that could move around, that could make something happen. They still lost the game. But because Steve Young came in the game, they started creeping back in the game. And he could avoid the Vikings pass rush, which at that time was just devastating with Keith Millard and Doman and those guys. I mean, they were incredible. But he took out the best quarterback in the history of the league. You know what I mean? And they had a really good team. It wasn't like they were a bad team. So it happens. It happens. And sometimes as the coach, that's a that is a, you know, you got to have some cojones and you got to make a decision that may not be popular with everybody, but you do it because you think it's in the best interests of the team. Yeah, man. I, I and you know, I say that not to assign the majority. I want to be clear on this. I'm not saying that they lost this game because of that one guy. No because, way. Be, not because even close. They're, they're, this was a total team loss. Coaches and players, offense, defense across yeah. the board. My point in offering this up as a, a way for that game to have been more competitive is that they, they needed more playmaking at that position. Given everything else yeah. that was going on, given that you couldn't stop them defensively, Given that they are, they are fearsome up front. I mean, man, Nicobe Dean is unbelievable. He, I, I, th I thought he was good before. I mean, some of the plays he made, it's like, man, that's just a great, that's just he's a something. hell of a damn play that dude just made. Yeah, he's I mean, it, that's not a bust offensively. It's not a not a bad call. That's just a great player making a great play. And the times he checked, he uh, you know, he caught those those, those swings or whatever it was, man. That's just a I'll big tell you what, too, Sam. Him. Talk about a smart, instinctive dude, too. Now it was he's got speed that jumps out. You can see that right away. But you instinctive, smart, understands the schemes. I mean, he's he just looked like he was totally comfortable with pretty much anything Michigan did. He can play in the box and knock the crap out of you. He can run to the sideline and chase down sweeps. He can drop into coverage. He can blitz. He just was really a good player. And their other linebacker. Uh, Walker's not a bad linebacker either. So yeah. they're pretty complete now. And, and, yeah. and, and if all things were all told, that's a very, very good defensive football team. And so that's why I'm I'm making it a point to say I'm not saying that they lost the game because of because of K McNamara, but I, I think that the assessment they made later in the game that man, for us to even have a chance to you know get past this rush, mm -hmm. we gotta put a more quarter more mobile quarterback in. I think after three drives. I mean, to even have a chance, you need more playmaking at that position. Yeah. And while hindsight is 2020, it's easy to say. Now, I was I was feeling that as a non-coach in the moment, like, man, I mean, think about how how much of the load they put on Stetson Bennett's shoulders by comparison. What did you say? 13 RPOs yeah, in the just first, in the first half. half? Yeah, the first half. Just they didn't do the much in the half. second half because – they didn't need to, but how many yeah. RPOs? How many RPOs did I don't know if you have this charted, but did they did they offer K McNamara because they and they RPO'd a lot less this season as a whole 
But, yeah. you know, there's a reason for that. They're less quarterback dependent. Yeah. I think you're going to have to be more quarterback dependent in this game. Yeah, I think there were only about five or six. I haven't counted, but the very it was on par with what they've been doing, you know, right. pretty, pretty much. It, 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 and why not? That's what they did. But you hit it on the head. When you want to play, now you're really into big boy. You're playing big boy football anyway, but now you're playing big, big boy football when you get in these playoffs because every team that you're playing is uh, really, really good. So uh, you may have to adjust, either change some personnel or adjust your style of play to accommodate better defensive teams. Now you don't, you hate getting away from what got you there. And that's what we said before. Don't, God dog, they do this. We're going to do what we do. And they tried to do that. Well, shoot, but, I, I didn't anticipate them being down 17 to nothing. You no, know, and, and that was my miscalculation. I'd say, yeah. I'd say, my, I'd say I said, I just, I, they're going to struggle some with Michigan's defense, but they never got to down in distance distances that exploited their protection where they were third. And when they, if they did, it was in the second half when it didn't matter. So now Aiden Hutchinson and, Jabo, they're not they're not doing what they did against Ohio State. If they would have put them in more third and longs, you would have seen them as a presence. Mm-hmm. You would have, but you never really got to that. So they're rolling. They're playing good down and distance. They're winning first down every time. You know, they're making good decisions with their run and pass game, and and you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Where the other the other side of the ball, we're dealing with way too many third and longs, and and now again. There's sharks in the water, the blood's in the water, and the sharks are coming after it. So uh, that was kind of the story of the game. It was the one thing Michigan throughout the season, Sam, kind of avoided. They kind of avoided these situations. They didn't have to because they dealt with good down and distances with fairly conservative play. But in this game, you just weren't going to get away with too conservative a play because this team was too stout on first and second down. Right, right. And so then after you get past the, the third drive, you get the three and out on the fourth drive, then you start pressing and you start getting turnovers. And I mean, all, you know, all the turnovers, as much as you want to give Georgia credit for the kind of game that they played, it felt like those turnovers were more about Michigan than they were about Georgia. Oh, well, definitely the last one. And I don't know all the all the story on the first one at the end of the half there, because that cost him. They scored a touchdown throw. It looked to me like Cade was trying to back shoulder him and just made a bad throw. He kind of threw it inside instead of outside. There was interference on the play, but the refs, they were letting yeah, a lot they of that go. Got so, away with interference. But, but he, the ball was not placed very well. And the guy, I think the guy was surprised he picked it off, to be honest with you. He had the ball and he, oh my God, I got an interception, you know. But the second one was really ill advised. They had to run a sluggo or a slant and go into the boundary side. Okay. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, they had a spacing route away from it, which is just a three three guys hooking up. And uh, when we coach that play, you, the quarterback will usually look over to see if the guy bites on the double move, okay? If he bites on the double move, you take it, see if you get it. But in that instance, he didn't bite. He was way – he went close. He, he was way over the top of it. Now the quarterback comes off and checks – the spacing side, okay? And it's kind of a good play because if you don't have the sluggo, you kind of move the defense with your eyes, and they guys come off defending the spacing side. But he had locked in to throwing that sluggo come hell or high water, and it, he ended up playing catch with a corner because that was not even close. So that that was very avoidable. Again, I'd like to know more of the story on the first one, but the second one was definitely a bad decision. Yeah, at, at, at best, the first one was bad ball placement. Yeah. Uh, which you which you pointed out, and uh, they don't call interference on that play. You know, maybe that's the maybe that's the thought. My guy's getting interfered with. I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a call that could have been. Uh, yeah, I've the, never coached a guy to throw it. I he's get a penalty. I, look, <laughs> I'm just I'm just trying to offer the benefit of the doubt. I'm not I'm not saying <laughs> that that's what happened, but you know, again, know. It, it's a, it's at least bad ball placement. Second interception yeah. was bad read. Bad read. And then if if you you know if it wasn't if it was what you what you thought it was then it was at least bad ball placement because it could there was even wasn't even an opportunity for Dalen Ball when to do the jump ball thing mm-hmm. at that point if that was the thought process and then of course I think I, I think Blake would tell you that was just bad ball security uh, on on his yeah. part so look we could we could go through every play in this game and and just. To put it in a nutshell, we would arrive at Michigan played its worst game of the season. No doubt. Against a great team that played it played stellar. They played stellar. So 
here you are playing your worst. They're playing their best. And it looks like that. I think if Michigan, you know, they play that game over again, they play better. I don't think that there are three touchdowns worse than that team, but I do think Georgia is the better team. I tip, I think you got to tip your cap to the coaches, tip your cap to the player execution. They scouted them well. They executed well. They got outstanding quarterback play. I don't know if Stetson Bennett could play that well again. That's the other thing. If they played this game a second or third time, could he play that well? Could he bat near a thousand like that? He was tremendous. And I got to give that kid credit because I was very pointed and say, I thought that Michigan, Michigan's quarterback position was going to outplay him. And he flipped that script and he flipped it in a big time way. So let's talk about Michigan moving forward out because let's, let's first of all, reestablish that this game does not obscure. They beat Ohio state. They won the big 10 championship. They made the playoff. And if you look back one year, they have a coach on the press, but they are a program on the precipice. When you talk about a coaching change, that coach is retained. He hires six, no, seven coaches. Cause Mo Linguist, who we hired, got the Buffalo job. So he hired seven coaches and basically batted a thousand with those hires. They come out, they craft schemes that put players on both sides of the ball. They identify who they are, where they're best on both sides of the ball. They play to that. It was by any stretch to repeat what I said at the beginning, a season that surpassed almost every reasonable expectation out there. I think that bears repeating. Yeah, it does. And, and I, that I alluded to that myself, but I think, okay, we got, we got to this point. Okay. What's going to get us to the next point. Okay. And to do that, I think you got to look at who's there. You know what I mean? George is there at Alabama. How the hell are they there? Are they better coached than us? I never want to admit that. I never want to think that. They may have a game. The, their coordinator, offense quitter, is kind of hot in this game. Had you know, But I never want to think that. Otherwise, they have to get another coach, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we got to do? We got to get the kind of guys that they get. And we got some of them. We got some of them. But obviously, and you hit it on the head, Sam, they're better. They still have positions. They're more complete at more positions than we are. So we have a recruiting issue, but we're Michigan, right? We're Michigan. We can, you know, we're not in a hole like some of these other teams. We can go get some of these guys. We can, there's Jordan Davis's out there somewhere that'll go to Michigan. You know what I mean? Uh, their quarterback played great. He really did. Now we got to get our quarterback to play great. He's got to put, oh, we got to get another quarterback, right? A better quarterback. Well, it's one of the two now. Because if, if you just keep repeating the same behavior, you're going to be left out again. So uh, we got to get our quarterback to play at the level Stetson Bennett played. Now, you can call him a walk-on all you want. He went a walk-on. <laughs> but I'm watching didn't look walk-on to me. Okay? So they got their quarterback to play well. They've, they're complete. They've got good running backs, nice stable receivers, big, huge linemen, really stout on defense. So that's what we got to aim at. We got to look at since we're to this point, we got to start aiming it now. How can we get to Georgia? And we don't have to be as good as them. But we got to be close so that we can coach. We can coach them up and maybe get a three three point win, and then keep building. Eventually, maybe we'll be better than them. You know. So, so, so Al, you know, I, I guess sort of give me the coaching view on this because I look at at next year's team. So, Aiden Hutchinson is going to be one of the top couple picks in the draft. David Jabo just declared yesterday. Uh, Chris Hinton surprisingly declared today. You got it, it sounds like it feels like uh Dax Hill is at least you know, there's a good chance at the very least that he declares. Now you have some young talent on that side of the ball. I'm knocking on wood, assuming that the coaching staff Sean Nua just was announced that he is going to SC, but you're assuming you're getting the coaching staff back mostly intact. So you're able to build on your first year, the foundation you lay, you laid in the first year of this scheme. But saying all of that, it is likely the case that your offense is going to have to carry more of the burden for the team, at least while you see who the new stars are, while you see who the new playmakers are. It means you have to score more points. Who's going to you have to be more balanced? I, I think you're going to need more playmaking from the quarterback position. I think that that calls for 
a wide open competition uh, coming in the spring and let the best man win. Now, before we say that that's automatically JJ, we can look at the, at the Georgia example. If they had JT Daniels was a five-star guy with experience from SC. He comes in, he's a starter. He gets hurt. Stetson Bennett gets in the back in the mix and he does not lose that position. Even once JT Daniels uh, comes back, which is why I stopped short of saying just anoint jj just, just give it to jj there's no question he's more talented there's no question he's more talented but there is a process out and i think it's important to to be consistent with that process to stay committed to that process and make it a competition but man if if you get in spring ball and fall camp and jj is you know if the disparity is what it looked like Let's just leave it in that game uh, with his, with the playmaking ability. I think you got to go with the young fella, man, with, with what this team is going to need next year. Yeah, I, and that's it's it's hard to hold off a talent. You know what I mean? A, a real talented kid is hard to hold off. Not impossible. And what's to say, you know, Cade McNamara can't do the same thing Stitz and Bennett, and Bennett did. Right. You know I mean? Now, I, he can't do some of the things J.J. can do. But – that doesn't mean JJ is the quarterback. His quarter it has to equate to points. It has to equate to wins, those types of things. So there's more to it than that. It's not quite that simple. Your biggest issue, and I'm just speaking from a coach's perspective, which I always do. I shouldn't even have to say that, I guess. But is uh, making sure you know you just won 12 games with a kid that started all uh, all 14, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're talking now about opening up a competition, which I would definitely do, no mm -hmm. question. But there are team dynamic issues here, okay? There are team dynamic issues that are sometimes the elephant in the room that a lot of people don't want to talk about but are prevalent. So uh, when you open the competition up, you make sure that it's fair and it's right, okay, and that your judgment has not already been made beforehand. Maybe you have the quarterbacks get hit in the foot spring. You know, you don't make them not live. Okay. Oh my God, hit the court. Well, is it a competition or not? Because if 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 a one quarterback's mobile and the other one's not, he gets cheated because every time somebody touches him, they blow a whistle. You know what I mean? Where he may be making some of those plays that uh, they blew the whistle on. So I'd make it as game like as I could. I'd make, you know, again see who the team tends to gravitate to knowing that there's gonna you know you could have a split locker room there are issues there are team dynamic issues now uh, at the end of the day i'm going back to what i said before you're the you're the coach you make the decision you let you do what you think's best for the team and it could break hearts either guy either guy It'll probably result in a transfer somewhere. Somebody will leave. They'll jump in that portal. That portal's got a lot of room in it, man. People keep jumping into that sucker. Um, so, but that is college football today. That's the way it's going to be. And I think it's probably going to, unfortunately, it's going to continue to be that way because um, I'm still not a big fan of being able to transfer with no penalty, but that's the way it goes. And you're going to have to deal hey, man. Coaches with those circumstances. No you coaches can leave with no penalty, Coach Borges. No, I know all about that. Yeah, I know all about that. But it is disappointing, you know. Uh, uh, but anyway, I think that's the way you got to approach it. You know what I mean? Um, but it won't be – there will be some – it won't be simple. That's I guess what I'm saying is it won't be simple. There will be something that, that complicates the situation. And as well as they did, you don't really you hate disrupting the apple cart too much. But you got to get better. If you want to take the next step, you got to be bold enough to make changes that not, may not be always popular. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of the point. I, I mean, the, the team dynamic, you talk about there are team dynamic issues from a locker room standpoint and leadership standpoint. There are team dynamic issues from a team composition point. The, the composition of next year's team is different. I think the needs from the offense, the needs from the quarterback position are different for next year's team. And who's best suited to meet those needs? I mean, if if you were bringing back this the, the same team, I I think the the competition would would still be important. 
but I I think it would I think that the battle, you know, the the equipment that you would need to win that battle wouldn't be the same, right? Because you you could afford, I think, to to not be as dynamic at the position uh, and, and still have a high level of performance. I just don't think that that's the case, Nick. I don't think that that on paper scores you enough points. The the approach this year, they could come back next year with the same approach, and I, Al, they're going to be able to run the football. They might be able to run the football better. They, I, I think you are. I think Andrew Gustavus had himself a whale of a final camp. Give that young man a lot of credit. I think that they are going to upgrade with Victor Oluwatimi. He was pro football focus, number two uh, run blocking center in the country last year. I think you're upgrading at that position athletically. You can make a case that they will be better up front. I think they will be better at receiver because of the experience and the return of Ronnie Bell. They'll be better at tight end because of the experience of Eric All and Schoonmacher grew over the course of the season, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, know, you lose Hassan Haskins, who is a Bell Kyle back, but here you come back with Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards, who can give you some of that tough physical running. Oh, by the way, he's a tremendous pass catcher. You could argue that they'll be as dynamic, if not more so, at that position. So every other spot, I mean, the weaponry is going to be tremendous. You can make the case that they could come back with the same approach that they had last year and still be a very potent offense with the same balance that they had this year. Problem is, like I said, to repeat myself, I don't know that that scores you enough points given what they lose defensively. I think they're going to have to put up more points. They're going to be more high octane with how much they light up the scoreboard next year to compensate for the time it's going to take to grow that defense up. Yeah, and the op- if your defense isn't as good, the your opportunities are less too. Just keep that in mind. You're, you may get a couple less series a game for whatever reason. And, and they had an unusual year with regard to turnovers. They had very few, very, very few. Uh, not often do you have a year of that few of turnovers, you know. So uh, there's so many factors that led to their – their uh, success that may not be prevalent in a year. So you're going to need, you are going to need a little bit more, uh, a little bit more chutzpah in your, in your, in your offensive side. I think there's no question about that, which again, uh, get, you get Ronnie Bell back. The receiver course is bad. will be better. I think probably better lines pretty much going to be the same, right? You probably lose one back. I just, I, the biggest issue is the quarterback, and it always is, right? I mean, if you don't have a guy that's a star, it's always the the, the, the thing people want to talk about. So we'll see how that shakes out. Let's see how the, that affects the dynamic of the team. And it, I'll be really curious to see how the defense rebuilds itself because they'll have a year in the system now, which is an advantage, a huge advantage. They'll know their calls. You'll see less mistakes. You'll just see things, not that they made a million mistakes, because I don't know that they did, but they you're going to see less of them just because they'll be more systematically sound. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the next year shakes out. Yeah, it, it was a tremendous rebound effort. I, I think, it, like, we can close how he started. I mean, a team that won 13 freaking games, uh, Al, a year after they were under 500, and about to fire the coach that that's the second most successful season, Michigan season of, of my lifetime. Now, Sam, yeah, would you say that the seven. fan base wants Jim Harbaugh back? <laughs> yeah. they do? Funny how things change in a year, right? Al? Do they want him back now. <laughs> Funny how yeah, he, somebody waved a magic wand, tapped him on the head. And now he's a great coach. Okay. And then they lose six games. They'll, they'll, they'll want to run him out of row. I, I, no one learns, Sam. No one learns. But yeah. that's coaching, I guess. You, we just coaches just kind of learn to accept that. But Well, hey, we as listeners to you and to Vance and to Devin and to Jack Miller and, uh, you know, Marcus Ray chimed in a bit. I think if you watched this show, I think you learned a lot. Maybe some of our, our viewers already knew a lot of football, already knew a lot of what we talked about. I would – I venture a guess that most didn't and learned a lot about football, but even those that knew the football concepts that were talked about on this show learned a lot about Michigan specifically. Mm -hmm. And all I can do is promise you that we're going to get even better next year. I thought, I mean, it was fulfilling. It was a lot of work, a lot of time and effort. 
I, I can't tell you how much many hours I looked at Al Borges on a Monday and a Tuesday. I was like, man, golly, I got to look at Al again. That was, <laughs> I felt the same way. That was painful being around. It's, it's really not a lot of fun being around you for 10 minutes, but when you think about like four hours. Four? Oh, I well, wish it was. I wish our sessions oh, were four hours. When, man, when did we have a four-hour session, Al? I tell you what, I'm going to negotiate my renegotiate my time. I want more money, and I'm not talking. A little, I want a lot more money. Okay. We, I don't know a four hour session. We didn't have a four hour session all season. No, you're probably right about that. I, I mean, I didn't. After a while, I became oblivious to the whole thing. You know, I felt like I was back in that coaching room watching right? videos again. You know, that's what it was. Well, you're just, you, and you're just, with you, you're just constantly pissing me off. You know, it's it's. We're doing good. We're doing good. We're doing good. And then that fan comes out again. And I just want to reach across and backhand you. And in my mind, I do it. I don't obviously do it, but in my mind, I do it. But, you know, the one thing that's been great, Sam, is is it's kind of uh, uh, taking care of my football fix. It's, you know, getting back and, and, and staying on top of the schemes. I always promised myself when I was a young coach, I'm never going to let the game pass me by. But I figured when I retired, who cares? I still don't like the thought of it. So I continue, you know, I still continue. Even when I'm not with you, I continue to study football. It's intriguing. It keeps my mind active. And uh, uh, you've given me that opportunity. I appreciate that. You do a damn good job at it. And even the harshest Al Borges critic. It's it's funny. You talk about the the, the change that we see in the Michigan fans with Harbaugh. Read the comment section and read what they say about Al Borges after watching this show, compared to what they were saying about you with your coach, Dal. Oh, yeah. It's like, no my difference. <laughs> when, you, when you're the pull caller, you got no chance. I mean, somebody's <laughs> going to hate you. I mean, I, I used to get bad mail from my mom. It, was, it wasn't it was good. You know what I mean? So you just kind of buy into that. That's part of the deal. I don't, I don't really need you. Because if you're looking at that stuff, you got problems. No thick skins, guys, in this. No thin skin guys in this business, Sam. It just yeah. doesn't work. So. Oh, well. Hey, in closing, you know, kudos to this this Michigan team. Team 142 was one for the memory banks. A tremendous season. Fellas, you know, we, we critique the game because we critique every game. All right. But I, I don't want that to in any way, shape, or form to be mis- misconstrued as an indictment of the season. This was an unbelievable season that, that team turned in, especially given the circumstances. Jim Harbaugh bet on himself. He bet on a lot of young coaches. Those young coaches bet on, in many respects, some unproven players, and they all proved themselves worthy of being called champions. And that is to be remembered and celebrated. So congratulations, fellas, for that. Uh, and to the fans, I hope that they you all have that perspective. I hope you enjoyed the ride. The finish was disappointing, but the ride was fantastic. Awesome. Even yeah. even spending all of it with Al Borges, Al, it, you know, <laughs> it, it was still it was still fun, man. Hey, I want to send a uh, shout out to Greg Robinson who passed away today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just found that out. His, his lovely wife Laura. Uh, Greg was a good friend of mine. I coached with him at San Jose State. I know he coached here at Michigan, but my thoughts and prayers are with Greg, and and uh, just we're gonna miss him. Great guy. Yeah, absolutely. I concur. Terrific human being, man. And, uh, it's always to have that perspective, too. We're talking about a game. We're talking about a game. Absolutely. Man. Fun when we can uh, talk about Michigan, a, a school that we all love. And so we will be back doing it again next year. And as good as it was, and I'm, I know we, I know what we were doing was good, Al. It was good. Uh, you know, that's not being conceited in any way, shape, or form. But I say that to say we're going to be even better next year, guys. Yeah, best analysis in the country. And number two is way behind us, okay? (laughs) Way behind us. (laughs) Looking forward to it. Al, as always, my friend, you know, I appreciate you. I love my guy, Gorgeous Borges. I hope you guys all love him, too, because he's going to be back with us next year on the Michigan Insider Breakdown, focused on the offense with Al Borges. Go Blue. (laughs) Go Blue.